I'm a science student by the CBSC sense of the terms, by choice, or so I would like to believe. Okay, I can't say anything because my dad's in the audience. Um, but yes, all jokes aside, I do have a deep love for science. My marks might say otherwise, but yes, I do have a deep love for science. But what excites me the most about science are those scientific concepts that can be used to explain scientific phenomena, but can also be used on a variety of other platforms. They can be used to explain sociological phenomena, political phenomena, economical uh, concepts, and so on. And in that regard, what I believe, in my opinion, is the most interesting subject in all of science is thermodynamics. More specifically, the, more, the most scientifically appealing topic in all of thermodynamics is the second law of thermodynamics. Now, entropy is the state of chaos, disorder, randomness, or more specifically, a state of highest probability. The second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of the universe is constantly increasing. And we're seeing that all around us. The universe is social universe living in is not just bordering on the verge of chaos, but is immersed in it. Now, these are the global grand challenges that Singularity University identifies the world's facing today. These are some of the sustainable developing goals that the United Nations plans on achieving in the next few years. And there are so many such bucket lists and goals that we're trying to achieve. And most of the time, doing is adding stuff to these lists. So Rikeshi and I thought of doing something different. We took a look at some of these lists the other day at a workshop, and we thought rather than adding stuff to it, why don't we club as many of these issues under a broad category? And we understood that regardless of what list you were to make, at the end of the day, it boils down to two key issues. The fight for space, and the fight for resources. And many a times, or throughout mankind's history, what mankind fails to identify is that the answer to our constant feud for uh, space and resources lies in space itself. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about, the era of space colonization. But I'm not here to talk about any of the science of Mumbo Jumbo, no. I'm not here to talk about the science behind it. Today, I realize that the people in the audience are not just scientists and researchers, but you're the future politicians, investors, and economists of the future. So today, I want to approach this particular concept from a more wide-angle perspective. Today, I don't just want to talk about how we can colonize space, but I want to talk about life itself in a space-colonized universe. So if I were to talk about life itself in the space colonized universe, the first place I'd start is how our world changes in the space colonized universe. More specifically, what is our world in the space colonized universe? Our world is no longer the planet that we live on, but it's the universe that we're now seeking to colonize. So if we were to get down to the first order of business, the most drastic change in the space colonized universe are businesses, the economy, and markets themselves. Imagine this, imagine having complete control over a company that has an infinite amount of resources. You never run out of supplies, you never run out of assets, and you can meet your production costs as much as you want, because along with that, you don't have to pay taxes or worry about any sort of government interference whatsoever. You have complete say in what resources you're obtaining. And that's the sort of benefit that living in a space colonized universe provides us. Because in a space colonized universe, according to space law, the space law that we've uh, instituted, it states that any private company is allowed to obtain resources from space and even uh, bring moon rocks from space to our planet um, for research and development and utilization and harvesting of these resources in space colonies that we are to build in outer space. And the best part of all of this is, there's no limit. There are asteroids in space that are three times the size of the Indian subcontinent. 
Imagine having that much access to space and resources. Not only do these asteroids live in our very own universe, they don't live in our own galaxy, they live in the asteroid belt of our very own solar system. Now on the screen are not just a bunch of random images of satellites and rockets. The first image is actually a satellite that conducts hyperspectral imaging and thermal, uh, thermal imaging to detect what sort of resources are present in any form of celestial bodies, asteroids, etc. This has been developed by planetary resources and is conducted and is currently being used to conduct tests on the Earth itself to get a better um, view on the composition of the planet that we're living in. The second picture is a premature um, idea of what a space colony would look like. And it's being put into reality by the company that developed that spacecraft that you're looking at, the last one, the one below. That particular spacecraft is the Dragon 2 spacecraft that was developed by SpaceX as a part of their Falcon series, um, which was an initial state in their development towards colonizing the planet Mars. So what we understand is that none of this is a fantasy. It's something that people and private companies are actually working towards. Now, you're going to ask me, Nikhil, it's, it's not like there can't be any liabilities whatsoever. To be very frank, the only liability that we're going to face is having an industrial capacity to meet that huge resource influx. How are you going to build that many industries to satisfy the amount of resources you have in your possession? Well, the answer lies in the fact that we can not only really obtain resources from space and build colonies for us to live in, but we can also build industries and manufacturing facilities in space itself. We can clear away land that we are presently using for these facilities and build them in outer space. Doing so, we might encounter problems as to, you know, how would we make people, how would we transport people to these uh, industries, how would we transport resources from point A to point B. And frankly speaking, the problems of the future can be solved with the solutions that the present itself has provided us with. This particular picture that's about to come on the screen was actually taken by the International Space Organization after successfully 3D printing their first materials in outer space in zero gravity. Now, this is just a, a few series of developments with regards to things like 3D printing and artificial intelligence. And with the combined effect of these developments, we might actually be able to conduct industrial and manufacturing in space without the assistance of any human being whatsoever. All of this said and done, what effects would this have on the environment that we're living in? As I already mentioned before, if we were to clear out all the land that we're presently using for industries, manufacturing facilities, we could use that land to provide affordable housing for the poor, carry out large-scale afforestation, and basically revitalizing the nature of the planet that we're living in. We can help the Earth do what it does best, and that's support life. So, living in a space colonized universe is in fact the most um, environmentally safe way to carry out our developments in the future. But it's not enough that we constantly fantasize about the future that we're about to live in. But we need to understand how we can bring that concept that might happen in the next millennia, a few decades or maybe even a few centuries ahead. And the answer, ladies and gentlemen, lies where all of you are sitting right now. It starts at schools and educational facilities. Yes, we have STEAM education, we have science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, but we need to add another A, and that A stands for astronomy. It's not enough that we just tell our students that there are these many planets in the solar system, and Pluto is a dwarf planet now, Pluto isn't a dwarf planet anymore, it's an actual planet, but we need to start telling them, or making them think in terms of what life on Earth is actually like. How can we reciprocate those same conditions that we're living in now on another colony. We need to make them start thinking in terms of how we can extract as many industrial benefits from this concept of colonization as possible. We need to start making them 
um, design their own colonies, we need to start making them play games like Space Frontier, because we need to nurture that interest that um, they need to have if they are to arrive at the space colonizer era. In doing so, we also need to ensure that countries all around the world do have their own space organizations. Because it's, yes, in a space colonized market, America, India, China, Russia, and many other countries that do have their own space organizations set up at the moment may do well in such an economy. But companies that don't have their own space organizations need to understand that in a space colonized market or economy, your industrial capacity or your development rate doesn't depend on um, your, just your industrial power or just the amount of iron that you're in possession of. It depends on the capabilities of your space sector. So companies and international organizations should take a combined effort to institute these space organizations all around the world. But all this said and done, it's not enough that we're technologically advanced. It's not enough that we're economically prepared to arrive at the space colonized era. There are countries that are separated by a minute's walk across the border. These very same countries might be separated by meters or maybe even kilometers, but they're separated even further because of cultural, ethnic, and gender differences. It's not enough that we're technologically or economically prepared to arrive at the space era, but we need to be socially mature to maintain our social integrity in the space colonized era. Imagine if this, if this minute's walk across the border was now expanded to a few light years. Imagine if we became a multi-planetary society. What sort of rifts and what sort of gaps in us as a species and us as a community would that create? So, at the end of my talk, we now understand that it's not just science that's going to bring us development. It's not just science that's going to um, ensure that we live a good life in the space colonized era. Yes, science might take us to the space colonized era, but each and every single one of us sitting in this room do have a role to play. We all have a say in how life changes in the space colonized era. And I know that I might seem like a 17 year old kid that, yes, I am 17, my height might be misleading. Uh, I seem like a 17 year old kid that's fantasizing about things that's going to happen a few millennia later and might not even happen at all. But it will happen. It is the most probable state. Our entropy will increase, not because we are tending towards the state of chaos, but because we're tending to this most probable future that is a space colonized era. And when it does happen, when it does arrive, a thousand years later, I'll be there to tell you I told you so. Now, I use the same line to include my speech yesterday during the rehearsals, and someone just told me, Nikhil, do you realize that you just said you'll be alive a thousand years later? But the matter of the fact is, I don't see that as an impossibility. Because with the way we're progressing now, anything's possible. Thank you.